Good morning, good morning, and welcome. It is wonderful to see you all this morning, and I want to welcome you here to, to Faith Baptist Church. I'm Borden Scott, I'm the lead pastor here, and I am just really looking forward to having this time together to worship as we seek God together. And we'll do that through prayer, we'll do that through singing, we'll conclude this morning with communion as well, this communion Sunday. And uh, that's actually going to be a big part of our focus, see, even through the message this morning. Uh, and I want to just begin with a call to worship. We're going to go to, to Psalm 16 and invite, and right after that, I'll invite our worship team to lead us in some opening music as we get started. But hear this reading from God's Word. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me, even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you have not abandoned me, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I invite our worship team to come and uh, start us off with uh, a couple of uh, praise songs this morning. Jesus, the only one. 
And if there are any kids who want to come up closer to the front, we're going to have our, our children's story time. You were, you were close enough. You were fine. <laughs> we're going to have our children's story time and then a little something else before you guys head out this morning. So I want to tell you something that, you know, it's pretty important that everybody learns sooner or later, and this, is, this can be helpful to us. And it's, it's this simple thing, which is that nothing just happens, Right? And let me tell you what I mean a little bit. All right, no, over there. Go to it. Like, if you are in your Sunday school class and your teacher hands you a worksheet or a coloring sheet to work on, do you know how that happened? Well, it didn't just appear. Somebody looked at all kinds of stuff about what Sunday school should be and decided we were going to do this and this and this today and found that sheet and got that printed and gave it to the teacher and somebody else made sure that there were markers somewhere and someone brought them over and so before that somebody went through hopefully you know once in a while and got rid of all the dead markers and brought some more that that worked and all of these things happened just so you could have a a coloring sheet in Sunday school. You know when we sing songs up in church behind us do you know that 
Those folks don't just kind of wander out the door on Sunday morning with some uh, instruments and then just see what happens when they get here. That's not how it works. They, you know, there's some people decide early in the week what music is going to go with our service and then somebody picks out the music and they figure out the right keys and they send it to everybody and people practice before Sunday and then they practice again on Sunday and someone puts music in the computer to appear on the screen and all kinds of things have to happen that people do for us. None of these things just happen. And so sometimes it's helpful to remember that. I want to share a Bible verse with you for a second. And it says this in 1 Thessalonians. There's a good tongue twister for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, it says, Everybody, honor the leaders of your church who work hard to help you and warn you about doing anything wrong. Respect them and show them love because they are straining to help you. And remember, no arguing among yourselves. That's a nice little add-on at the end there. It's just, just threw that in right at the end. It says, just remember that nothing just happens. When things are going on, people worked hard to make that happen. And so it can be helpful to say a little thank you to your Sunday school teacher, to the other volunteers, maybe to the people who played the music and you thought that was really nice one day, or all the little things that happened, people make those happen. So I'm going to ask for you kids to be, just to have a little moment of patience here, because we're going to spend a couple more minutes just doing that thing that the Bible just asked us to do. Uh, And I'm going to, in a moment, uh, invite up uh, a few different people as part of that. So through the last couple of years of the pandemic, it's been pretty easy to lose track of different things, to lose track of one another, to lose track of what's happening at different levels of church life. And uh, as we begin this season of, of kind of rebuilding and regathering, I thought I'd really like to recognize those who the congregation has chosen to call as its leaders. And we just had our annual meeting and just made some changes to that. Um, so there are many, many people who serve in a huge number of ways here, but th- this morning, My intention is just to highlight those who serve on our two main leadership groups. And those are what are called our church council and our board of deacons. And these are the people that we vote on at our our annual meeting to entrust with some responsibility and authority to either do the things that the church has said we agree that we should do, or in between our meetings to work on all kinds of little odds and ends that that pop up in the meantime. And so uh, that's what... That's what happens. And without them, we really can't function at all. Their role is very important to us. And when they bring their faithfulness, when they bring their energy, when they bring their, their passion, and their, uh, when they bring their best to that, well, we know it blesses our whole church and it helps us to move forward. So I'm going to invite our, our members of our church council and of our board of deacons to come up. And that's those who are continuing, those who are beginning, and those who just finished. Everybody all at the same time. And so... Yeah, yeah, you're going to be up in a second, yeah. And you guys can just, oh. <laughs> so we, can do, we can just stand along the front wherever you're comfortable, I guess. And uh, so we're going to have a few folks uh, come up here. From our, our church council, we, our moderator is, is Kevin Already can't be with us this morning. Our clerk is Kathy, and I think she also can't be with us, but I think we have most of the rest. <laughs> We have, uh, we have Herb up here as our financial representative. I saw him. There he is. We have, uh, that's right. we have Paul here from our, our facilities coordinator, everything to do with our building. We have uh, Amy here as our family ministry representative, uh, Amanda, who's just joining as a new member at large. And then we have Allison on that side, <laughs> who is our incoming chair of the deacons. So she's chair of the deacons and serves on church council. Art is beside Allison, and uh, besides playing our music, he's just joining in as one of our new deacons as well. And over on this end, of course, we have Pam and we have Don, who are outgoing deacons. Pam was our former chairperson and serving on council as well. Don also served as deacon and a council member as a member at large. So there's not a test after on all the names, but it doesn't hurt to just see who, who is who in all of this. And... So I just, I just want us to be able to recognize who they are. I want us to be able to remember and, uh, and even be able to offer prayer for the work that they do and uh, extend thanks for those who are moving along as well. So first, I'd just like to invite you to join me in a word of prayer for them. Almighty God, we praise you. We, we give you our thanks for your grace toward us in Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again, and through whom we have life and hope and purpose. We thank you as well for the gifts of service that by your Holy Spirit you have given to all of your people so that we may each serve you and serve others. 
Together, we now lift up those who have offered their gifts and time and attention to serve as deacons and as church council members. Through your Holy Spirit, help and encourage and equip them for the work you have called them to do in service to us all. Renew their strength and hope in you. Give them joy and endurance in their work. Grant them wisdom and unity as they serve together for your sake. And we pray that by your grace, they will represent you with sincerity and wholeness of heart and grow in sensitivity to your leading and to the needs of your people. May they have the humble attitude of a true servant of God. And for those who are concluding their service in this role, we honor the effort they have exerted, the burdens that they have borne, and the time that they have given as an offering to you. Bless and keep them and guide them in this transition. Show them how to answer your call on their life in this next season. And give them rest and peace according to their need. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. I'm going to keep Pam and Don for a second, but I'm going to, everyone else can <laughs> head on over. Not that we couldn't extend this. Yeah, a little appreciation for them. Thank you. <laughs> so just a quick word about those who are, are heading out, of course. We had, we had three deacons who are uh, moving, uh, you know, have finished their terms of time of service. And Elaine Stearman is one. She's not with us right now, but we're thankful to her for the, the, the work and the perspective she brought, and particularly uh, the work she did on behalf of our Benevolent Fund. Uh, a lot of behind-the-scenes things to help people in need and administer those funds. Don, of course, besides being a deacon and a council member, he served as our congregational care coordinator for a while, and he always helps us out as our accessibility auditor, too. And so that's <laughs> uh, something good that he brings to us. And, and uh, Pam is finishing up five years of uh, serving on the deacons, almost all of that as our chairperson. Uh, and so, you know, that, that has meant a great deal of, of number of things, yeah, being active in a huge number of different ways in caring for people, in decision making, in just thinking about what's going on in our building, making this a hospitable place. There have been a huge number of things. And I think anyone who's been around long recognizes uh, just how integral uh, she has been in the life of our church. And, and we expect will continue to be, although without maybe some of the title that <laughs> goes with it for a time. And so just out, out of that, I have just one little thing. Hang on. Just in case this next season allows for a little bit more time tending things in the garden, we thought you could maybe use a new set of gardening gloves and a, a little <laughs> kneeling pad. And <laughs> I've, I've heard maybe it got neglected a little bit uh, through these last couple years of pandemic trying to help us out here. So maybe, uh, maybe some good things can, can bloom there. So I just wanted to extend uh, my thanks and, and on behalf of us all. And because we joked about it a million times, we'll, we'll send you out with a little bit of music, too. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> I love the bank pipes, but if I leave them on too long, my wife will have words with me after. So, <laughs> Kids, thank you for your patience as we say thank you to those who help and lead us. You guys are welcome to head on out to Sunday school now. Have a great time out there starting your new unit. a couple of announcements as we transition to the kids heading out. Oh, we did have our annual meeting. Uh, if you didn't get the chance to check it out, there is video of, uh, uh, of the proceedings on, online on our website in the annual meeting tab. That'll only stay up a little bit longer, so if you really want to see that, uh, check that out soon. Um, but all of our new business passed. We're working our way toward incorporation. We brought in our uh, no new nominees for positions, as you saw some of those. Uh, might as well. Eric is here. Speaking of people who are coming on soon, Eric, you want to stand up for one second? Uh, one other thing we approved at the annual meeting is that as of May 2nd, uh, for two years after that, uh, Erica will be our new um, associate pastor for her two-year internship here with us. And we can say congratulations on that one. 
So she gets, she gets two years with us until the, uh, the armed forces is convinced that she knows everything she needs to know, and then they'll uh, put her to work after that. So. Uh, there are new church lists out today, by the way. Uh, so th- these ones are, I don't know what to call them, goldenrod, burnt umber, some color that I don't recognize. But uh, they are, if, you ha- we, if you have an old one that is white or green from March, we do ask if you get rid of that. Uh, there was a piece of information on there that wasn't intended to be. And so we're asking people to destroy the old ones or bring them back to the church office. Uh, and if you've got a goldenish, yellowish one, then you're in good shape. And those are in mail folders now. So are Easter letters. Uh, Easter week is almost upon us, and we are certainly looking forward to that season and gathering together. So the letter describes what's going on, but on Good Friday, we have uh, something brand new. We're doing a special program here where it's based on the, what are called the Stations of the Cross. And so uh, you get the opportunity to come and, and go around to different areas where you'll have opportunities to interact with Scripture and some hands-on activities and things that tell the Easter story for either reflection or you can bring your kids because it's all intergenerational, it works for all ages, and they can, you can teach them the Easter story through that. And then we'll have a time of refreshments and hot cross buns and things at the end. So that's 10 o'clock on Good Friday, our new experience. And then uh, on Easter Sunday, we'll have our celebration service at 10.30. We have our a hot breakfast at 9.30 and some activities for kids in between. And uh, you may have opportunity to check out some of those stations before service if you have extra time as well. There's no Maundy Thursday service in person. There will be some online resources that will go out just to help with reflection for that this year. We also have an Easter offering. Uh, And so our special offering this year, we normally pick a missions project for that, and we have again. We're going to support CBM's Grow Hope project, and so that includes some farms outside the Truro area where farmers volunteer their time uh, to to grow crops, and those crops are sold, and then through a partnership with the Canadian Food Grains Bank, um, when the proceeds are used for emergency relief, the government of Canada multiplies those by a factor of four, I believe, ultimately. And so um, uh, that's what we're going to do with that. And um, that we expect there will be a great need for that kind of emergency relief this, this year. Among other things, the Ukraine is one of the biggest producers of grain for a lot of places, in, especially countries in Africa. And so there were already a lot of strains from the pandemic, but those will likely grow this year. So that is where those, uh, that offering will be directed. And you can contribute to it through eTransfer. Just note that it's for you know, CBM or Easter offering on there. We have special envelopes as well that you can check off Easter and you can put uh, something in for that and that way it gets sent to the right place. All right, that's lots of time for announcements. Let's just recenter ourselves on, our, on God through our time of worship and the congregational prayer. So I invite you to, to join your prayers to mine. Loving God, in the midst of all the things that we're trying to manage and take care of and uh, allow us to pause in this sanctuary for a moment and consider that Easter is growing near. Lord Jesus, 2,000 years ago, you were preparing for what was to come, for the sacrifice that you dreaded but were willing to make for our sake. You saw the road ahead. You sought to prepare your followers. You found moments of calm and comfort where you could, and you drew strength from your Father through it all. There are some among us who are facing hardships and challenges and who are, who are not looking forward to the road ahead of them as they see it today. As our Savior who understands and empathizes with this, I pray that they would be able to seek you and find you and be encouraged by your presence. Give them the peace that passes understanding when they bring their cares to you and help them to know that they are not alone in what they face. Be with Ron as he recovers in hospital and we give you thanks for his progress. Be with Al and Betty once again, and we praise you and give you thanks for the good news of Betty's return home. Bless and keep those in, the midst, in our midst who are struggling with things physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. Show us the ways in which we can love and serve them. We ask for your wisdom and your courage to do what is right, especially for our local and national leaders. Bring a just peace to our troubled world, and we pray in particular for the Ukrainian people and for the work of our own Baptist churches and aid organizations who are trying to care for those who've been displaced by this terrible war. Renew our hope today. When you looked ahead at a cruel cross you endured and you claimed victory over sin and death, the greatest enemies of all, you can do all things. You can bring life from death. We believe, but help our unbelief as we seek to trust you more fully. 
with gratitude for what you have done and hope in what you have promised. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn things back to our our worship team and they'll they'll offer us a hymn of trust. Feel free to remain seated for this one. Uh, This morning's scripture reading will come from Mark's gospel in chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. And we'll have that on the screen behind me, but you're also welcome to take a moment to look that up in in your Bible or however you access your Bible, and we'll have that uh, reading together. All right, from God's Word I read that on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house that he enters, The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left. They went to the city. They found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. And while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they were saddened. And one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. 
While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying to his disciples, Take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. God bless to our understanding this reading from his word. Now there is an incredible diversity in the many groupings of Christians, past and present. We have and we continue to disagree and differ on all sorts of things within the larger body of Christ. And I found some examples this week that were truly weird. Right, there apparently is a German sect from the 16th century, and we call them the Abkadarians, to use the words, letters ABC at the beginning. I don't, I don't think they call themselves much of anything, but they believe that all human knowledge should be avoided. Like they, they thought that you'd really succeeded in life if you managed to never learn the letters of the alphabet. That was how seriously they took it. There is a little-known early church offshoot called the, the Ophites, who they were just really into the Genesis narrative with the serpent, so they liked to, you know, release snakes to slither around during worship time. So, I don't know how you'd feel about that one, but, ooh. And apparently, once upon a time, there are still a few, but there used to be about 100,000 what are were called Southcottians, and they believed that a lady from Devon, England, named Joanna Southcott, was a prophetess who would give birth to a new messiah. And she never did have that baby, but she did leave behind this fascinating, mysterious box. And her followers believe that it's supposed to be opened during a time of great crisis in the presence of all 24 bishops of the Church of England. And then something will happen. Now, opinions differ as to whether the box has never been opened or whether somebody did open it and find some random papers, a lottery ticket, and a horse pistol inside. They also claimed that the world would end in 2004. So, the differences between the larger Christian denominations are obviously not quite so dramatic, although there are still plenty of them. Most Christians gather for worship on a Sunday, but our, our cousins of the Seventh-day Adventists, they worship on Saturday. A minority of Christians are strict pacifists, so you, you can't be a full member of many Anabaptist churches, for example, if you were a police officer or a soldier or someone who won't swear off of all violence, even in self-defense. Most Christians, of course, practice baptism, but at different ages and using different methods. So some will, you know, dribble water gently on babies, and we Baptists like to wait till you're a little more grown because we want to completely dunk you. And one of the, the very first practices of the early church, and probably the most universally observed aspects of Christian worship, though, is that is communion. And it's not even 100% with that. The Salvation Army, for example, don't do communion or baptism, oddly enough. But the number of Christians who don't practice communion regularly is very, very small, even if we have some different ideas about what it is. And so on this Communion Sunday, having missed quite a few Communion Sundays over the past two years, I think it might be beneficial to reflect on why we do what we do when we approach the Lord's table. What is actually going on when we take our little piece of bread or our cracker or whatever that thing in the lid of the combo cups we're using now for COVID actually is? How is it supposed to affect us as we participate? So the last couple months, we picked one spiritual practice all month. For the month of April, we're going to pick a different one each week, but they're all practices of worship. And so we begin this week with communion. And I think it's also a timely subject as we head into Easter week, as we look to where the Last Supper is such a prominent part in that story. So before we participate in our time of communion, let's see if we might gain a deeper appreciation for the act. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt a little uneasy about the language and the practice of communion with its talk about eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood, but if you ever have, that's, you're not alone in that. It was a struggle for the people of the New Testament. It also led to a lot of nasty rumors and suspicions about the early Christians as well. And so before I dig into our reading from Mark 14 from a minute ago, I want to take a quick stop in John chapter 6 where Jesus gives a sermon that freaks a lot of people out because Jesus starts talking about how he is bread and people need to eat his flesh. And since consuming human flesh or any kind of blood was repugnant and strictly forbidden in Jewish law, this was not well received by anybody. So I'm going to read now from John chapter 6, verses 53 through 57. Because people start to get upset at what Jesus is saying, and then Jesus responds to that, and he says, Very truly I tell you, 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. So as you can imagine, that did not help the situation with that clarification. In fact, he made it sound way weirder to everyone, and quite a lot of people stopped following Jesus after, right after that. They said, this is, this is a hard teaching. You know, who can understand it? And this is something that happened a few times in John's gospel where people misunderstand Jesus' teaching about a spiritual reality because they take his words a little too literally. But as one Bible scholar, Warren Wearsby, summarizes it, he says, all Jesus said was, just like you take food and drink within your body, which becomes part of you, so you must also receive me into your innermost being so that I can give you life. Jesus was talking about what it means to put faith in him, to have the eternal life he promised. Now, John 6 is not about taking communion, because taking communion is not required for a person to have the life of Jesus within them. But there is shared language here, which is helpful, because communion is an opportunity to be nourished by Jesus in the kind of way he talks about here. Now, when we go to the book of Mark, we have what might be the most straightforward account of the Last Supper in his gospel. The final meal that Jesus shared with his disciples immediately before he was arrested and subjected to that improper trial and ultimately executed. And Jesus knew this was coming. This was the plan, as dreadful as this suffering would be on his way to victory. And because Jesus was aware of how this would play out, he planned his meal with quite a lot of care. And so with his more than human knowledge, Jesus directed his disciples to this person who would provide them the space And they prepared the traditional Passover meal, which would have meant roasting a lamb and setting out unleavened bread and wine and preparing bitter herbs and this sauce that's made from dried fruit moistened with vinegar and wine, which they would dip the bread in all together out of the same bowl. And then they ate this together. And Jesus did a lot of ministry around the table with others. And in this case, he started off by addressing some very serious business because he wants to let his closest followers know that actually one of them is a traitor. So he says this, and after a little while, Judas leaves, and they eat their main course, which had to have felt pretty awkward at that point, that people must be awfully worried. And then Jesus used the items in front of them to teach and prepare them for what was coming. And in Mark's account, Jesus took that bread, and he broke it, and he simply told them, take it, and the eat it is implied, but take it, this is my body. And for the cup, he told them, this is my, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And in this case, it's more clear to us that his meaning is spiritual, not physical. He gave them actual bread and wine to eat and drink. And Jesus spoke about his body, which would be broken, and his blood, which would flow from the cross. And they were going to see this soon. They would understand this soon. And he invited his disciples to make this connection between these events and between the bread and the wine. And so he gave new meaning to these common items to highlight the importance of his sacrifice, the thing that he was about to offer for them and for all of us. All right, so, so far, so good, hopefully. This might make us a little more familiar with what communion is about, what some of what Jesus' words might have meant, but it doesn't explain what we think is happening when we participate in communion as part of worship today. And this is where those differences, again, between Christian denominations come into play because we think differently about the way in which Jesus is present when we do communion together. Right? So some people might know that, that Roman Catholics believe that Jesus is physically present in the bread and the wine, that once it's properly prepared and blessed, that, that change is not visible, but that they are truly eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus when they partake. And when you move toward the Anglican or the Reformed side of Christianity, they see Jesus as being spiritually present in the bread and the cup. And so he is truly in the elements in their understanding, though they are not transformed into his actual body and blood. And then when you get a little farther down the spectrum of denominations toward the Baptist end, we don't consider Jesus to be more present in the communion elements than he is everywhere else. Jesus is omnipresent and not more present in the bread or cracker or wine or juice or whatever it is we choose to use. In our case, the bread and cup are usually treated as spiritually significant symbols 
that remind us of Jesus and what he did for us in laying down his life to rescue us from sin and death. Now, this matters because it changes what you think the act of communion does. Right? Some Christian traditions call communion a sacrament because they believe that participating in it causes God's grace to flow down onto them. The act of communion, particip- simply participating in it, has that effect in and of itself. But other traditions, like Baptists, call communion an ordinance instead of a sacrament. We see it as a practice that demonstrates our faith in God. And so in this case, the act itself doesn't do that much on its own, but rather it creates an opportunity for us to show faithfulness. And I think the bread and the cup as symbols is, personally, I think it's more correct than the Catholic view, which is, you know, shocking as a Baptist boy born and raised. It's what I see in Scripture, makes the most sense to me. But I think we should make some effort not to think too small about what communion is. And learning a little bit from our our brothers and sisters in other parts of the church is not a bad thing in this. Because there's a risk on the Baptist side of things that we turn communion into a kind of a dead ritual instead of it being about the very word that communion means, which is communing, being present to God and to one another, connecting with our ever-present Savior and the people who are also grateful to have been saved. In Luke's account, we find a request from Jesus when he shares the bread and the cup. He says, do this in remembrance of me. But that doesn't mean we just take the wafer and we take the juice and we say, all right, Jesus died for me. Thanks, Jesus. If that's how we approach communion, then our Anglican and Catholic friends would be right to feel bad for us. Warren Wearsby notes that the word that we translate as remembrance, it means more than just in memory of. Right? You can do things in memory. Oops. We can do things in memory of a dead person, but Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. And that sentence, uh, that word carries the S idea. And this this sentence is a little mind-bending, so maybe I'll say it twice. But Wearsby says, the word carries the idea of present participation in a past event. That's got kind of a weird time travel thing going on. But the idea of present participation in a past event. The idea that what we are doing now is part of what happened then with Jesus, who is with us now, and who instituted it then. He writes, because Jesus is alive as we celebrate the Lord's Supper by faith, we have communion with him. This is not some magical experience produced by the bread and cup. It is a spiritual experience that comes through our discerning of Christ and the meaning of the supper. So the presence of Jesus among us in communion is very important. It's what we're after. It's what the symbols of the bread and the cup point us toward. We're being invited to join in something that began 2,000 years ago and has continued by nearly every follower of Jesus ever since. And we carry on in remembrance because we believe that Jesus is with us, that he is with us in a particularly meaningful way when we carry out this act together. Just sitting in the room and listening to the words and taking the elements, that may not do all that much to change you, But when you accept that invitation to join Jesus in his supper, to seek his presence with gratitude and humility, well, that can change you a great deal. In her Spiritual Disciplines Handbook uh, that I've been using through some of these series, Adele Calhoun lists some of what she calls the God-given fruit of the practice of communion. And that includes some different things like developing a deeper love for Jesus, keeping company with Jesus no matter what happens, or appreciating the diversity of other believers who take the Lord's Supper with you. But there was one in particular that stood out to me as I was kind of working through it this time around, and it said, a growing awareness of your own spiritual poverty. And to me, that means recognizing just how little we bring to our relationship with God and how great our need is. Like When we join together and we partake in communion, We don't do that as a people who have life and faith figured out. We don't commune with people who have expertly lived up to our calling as followers of Jesus. We don't come overflowing with all of the strength and the wisdom that a person might want or need. We come poor. We come bearing wounds that we can't heal on our own. We come having inflicted wounds on others that we don't know how to fix. We come with problems in our lives that, try as we might, we have not been able to solve. We come as people who have not, at times, been shining examples of what it means 
to be a disciple of Jesus since last we gathered. We often come tired. We may even come with a sense that our faith is fragile or weak. We come spiritually poor and in need of nourishment. And when I was reading through Mark 14 this time in preparation, the part that struck me the most, the phrase that stood out, was how the disciples responded to Jesus when he told them that one of them was a traitor. And they all, they all looked at each other, and every single one, it says, kind of answered Jesus back uh, and saying, you know, oh, you don't mean me. <clears throat> you know, that can't possibly, it's not me you're talking about, right? I mean, it can't be me who has betrayed Jesus or who would betray Jesus. And of course, a little later, Jesus also reveals to Peter that Peter is going to deny him three times, and Peter cannot believe that that could possibly happen until it does. You and I also come to the Lord's table each and every time, as people who are going to deny or betray Jesus, and He knows it. In the hours and the weeks and the months ahead of us, He knows that we will choose our preferences and comfort over His way at times. He knows that we will choose what is convenient over what is most right. Jesus knows that before long, we're going to treat somebody in our life in a way that is an embarrassment to His name. But that's not a reason to run away from or avoid Jesus. That is why we so badly need his presence and the presence of other people who walk by faith. Barbara Brown Taylor writes this. She says, when Jesus holds up the cup and offers what is in it as the fluid of forgiveness, which is an interesting line, the fluid of forgiveness, he's not talking to people with a short list of minor sins. He's talking to people who will turn him in who will scatter to the four winds at the first sign of trouble, who will swear that they never knew him. He's talking to people who should have been his best friends on earth, who turn out to not have a loyal bone in their bodies, and he is forgiving them ahead of time as surely as he had said, I know who you are. I know you will not be innocent of the blood in this cup, of this cup, but I will not let that come between us. Let my life become your life through the blood of this covenant." We're all going to deny or abandon or betray Jesus as we walk through this earth just as much as his first disciples did. But Jesus invites us to his table anyway, full of grace and forgiveness, offering us the spiritual nourishment we need to carry on. And so we come poor, and we're meant to leave blessed when we accept his invitation. So I hope that we will not have our ability to regularly gather around the Lord's table interrupted so much anymore. Now that we can come together in this way more consistently, let's not go through the motions on this. And I say that to myself as much as I say it to all of you, because communion is a rich remembrance. And to quote one final time from Calhoun, the, the, broken, or the bread broken and the cup poured out signify the cost of the communion meal. Christ's blood and body were sacrificed for us, and this sacrifice becomes a pattern for our own journey. In many ways, the Lord's Supper opens us wide to a divine mystery of redemption. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And explaining the mystery may be beyond us, but that doesn't mean we can't participate in it. In communion, Christ is here for us. We eat of his body, and we are part of his body, the one loaf. Though we may feel alone in our journey, we are part of the train of apostles and prophets and martyrs and saints and all servants of God. The meal reminds us that we belong and we are not alone. Because of Jesus, all will be well. I can't really think of a better note to end on, so let's prepare to come to the Lord's table. Join me in a brief word of prayer. Lord Jesus, this time is about your presence, which we believe is here in our midst as you have promised, but we are not always open to it. We can be distracted, we can be resistant, we can, be, we can refuse to open ourselves up to you because well, we know what you'll find, but you already know, and you invite us anyway. You invite us to this table to be with you, to participate in something that you began and which you are still in here and now. So, Lord Jesus, be present. Be present within us. Be present among us. And help us to sense 
that you are near. In Jesus' name, amen. To you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who have the love and concern for your neighbors, who intend to leave a new, lead a new life, following the commandment of God by walking in holy ways, draw near with reverence, faith, and thanksgiving, and take the supper of the Lord to your comfort. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you have any claim on heaven's reward, but because in your frailty and your sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for a spirit. And now that the supper of the Lord is spread before you, lift your minds and hearts above all selfish fears and care. Let this bread and this cup be to you the witness and signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Before the throne of the Heavenly Father and the cross of the Redeemer, may your humble confession of sin, make your humble confession of sin, dedicate your lives to Christian obedience and service, and pray for the strength to know and to do the holy will of God. I invite Allison to come now and offer us a scripture reading and word of prayer for our communion time. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 6, verse 41 to 51. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Let's bow our head as we give thanks for the bread and cup. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into even closer fellowship with you as we partake together of the bread and cup in grateful remembrance of what you did for each one of us on Calvary's cross. Lord, fill us with your love so that our love may flow back to you as well as out to others. I pray that our lives will glorify you in thought, word, and deed, and that with each passing day, we draw further into close communion with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have come together today in obedience to our Lord's command to share the Lord's Supper. To its blessing and fellowship, all disciples of the Lord Jesus who have confessed him before people and wish to serve him may come. This is not our table, but the table of our Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and in the presence of his disciples, he broke it, telling them, take, take it, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ, take and eat.
we remember also that after supper that night, Jesus took his cup and he told them that this was his blood which would be poured out for many, that would usher in a new covenant to allow us to come to God directly through him and not through other means. And so I invite you now to take and drink Christ's blood shed for us. And as we read, before they went out, they, they sang a hymn. And so our, our worship team will lead us in our, in our communion hymn for today. And I invite you to use that as an opportunity to continue to, to reflect on, on our time of communion. Please stand.
Where there is darkness, take his light. Where is there is despair, take his love. Where there is death, take his life. And know this, the Lord is with you as you live for him. Amen.